Sober thoughts from that abysmal Rutgers game. We're going to get into your Twitter thoughts, Dino's reaction, plus a player has left the program out of the blue. There's lots to get to on the Locked On Syracuse podcast. You are Locked On Syracuse, your daily podcast on the Syracuse Orange, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Okay, Tuesday, Locked On Syracuse podcast. Tim Leonard, Tyler Rocky here with you as we are every single weekday throughout the football season. Still talking about SU football right now. I don't know when it's going to be basketball season around Central Did New you York. you see Mike Waters' that. tweet the other day? It was like, for those wondering, uh, Lafayette, November 9th. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It feels like we're getting earlier and earlier every year before we start thinking about basketball season. And uh, yeah. I, I don't think the score 17 seven was like, Oh man, it's basketball season. But the way the game played out was had a right. very much a feel of, okay, let's hang it up. But we're, we're still gonna, you know, have some optimism here. I, let's, let's start with some positive news. I forgot to mention this on yesterday's podcast and I'm sure you saw this time, but shout out Chandler Jones, five sacks. Yeah. He's a former Syracuse guy. That's awesome. more with uh, Syracuse. I mean, be nice. Right. If he was still there. I guess there was a, a piece of good defensive news, and I know today we said we were going to have some positive stuff for the defense, but Michael Jones, ACC linebacker mm-hmm. of the week, unfortunately, because of all the other news that's out there, we might have to save some of our defensive thoughts for tomorrow, but, I mean, he played a hell of a game. The whole defense played a hell of a game. If you look at the PFF grades, I think the first seven or eight guys in terms of rankings for grades were all defensive. All of yeah. them. And some of them... Were thrown into the fire like Caleb Okachukwu had to come in because Kingsley Jonathan didn't play in that game. And he played pretty right. well. Yeah, no, I mean, we can get into the PFF grades tomorrow, but defense was good. Defense was really good. And I don't think uh, Mikael Jones year. had, I mean, he had a great game. He didn't body slam a guy from what I saw. <laughs> Maybe that was a little bit too much. But anyway, we're, we're not going to talk about the refs. We hashed a lot of that out on yesterday's podcast. But uh, let's start with the Ben LeBros news, because that comes out yesterday. Stephen Bailey is on top of that. We can give him a scoop point, I guess, in the Syracuse yep. scoop standings. Uh, but, you know, kind of a bummer. I mean, this is a guy that was pretty highly recruited. He's on the week one depth chart as a starter. He's sort of sharing reps with uh, Simmons in the first week and actually mostly was not really playing a whole lot. He played 19 snaps in the first week at Ohio, was not with the team, didn't seemed to be anywhere near the uh, dome on Saturday against Rutgers. And then boom, Bailey drops the news that he's left the program. So now you've got Landon Morris who left at the beginning of this year, didn't play anything for Syracuse as a freshman that we kind of liked at the tight end position. Cody Shear, the offensive lineman from Arizona state who came then left. I don't know how much you want to make of that. Willie Tyler, same thing. He didn't even really ever come to Syracuse, but he committed from Texas decommitted, but a lot of guys leaving the program. I don't think the Willie Tyler news, you can really lump into this because he probably didn't even realize what Syracuse was all about yet. But I don't know. Not great that LeBros, a guy that I really liked, a really athletic guy, is basically out before really making an impact at Syracuse. And let's rewind two years ago, too, when Ryan Alexander yeah. left midseason as well. I mean, this isn't good. There's got to be some sort of internal issue here that people do not know about. And I hope something comes to the forefront of why these players are leaving because it is time and time again, and especially this season. I'm, I don't know what the problem is because I don't think it's necessarily the losing, okay? Something, whether it's promises that are being broken, whether it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know. There's something else out there, and, and I don't know what it is. Right, and you could, I guess, make the case, oh, well, we got some super seniors to come back this year. That's a good sign maybe for the foundation and sort of the culture that Dino is building there. Tommy DeVito hasn't left. And in the case of Landon Morris, like we talked about it when he made his decision. It never really made sense to me if you're a pass-catching tight end why you would come to Syracuse. I look at what Luke Benson's doing this year, and he's really been pretty shaky. His PFF grade wasn't great. He had that bad penalty. He's missed some blitz pickups. He's just not a blocking tight end. And that's right. all that Syracuse is asking tight ends to do. So he's a prime candidate, I think, to leave after this year. And I guess you could lump Aaron Hackett, Nikeem Johnson, Jawar Jordan. There have been some transfers as well. 
that comes when you're a losing football team, but it is weird to see guys leave in the middle of the season. And the, the fascinating thing is, is that, I mean, yeah, you list off all those names and it's mid season stuff. I, I don't get it. And he has sort of fallen out of, out of the rotation a little bit. Like yeah. Jason Simmons has played pretty well. I think, I mean, all the defensive players, I, I really think have had a pretty strong season thus far, but where was the fit? I, I don't know. It, to me, we kind of speculated too in the offseason that Simmons was maybe not going to start week one, but eventually he will be the yeah. starter just because of versatility. And I think we're starting to see that play out now. And the coaching staff, it seems like, likes Simmons a little bit more. Right. I mean, my educated guess would be that the coaching staff pulled in LeBros and said, hey, we're going to go with Simmons as the starter, just so you're aware. And I don't know if what happened from there, basically, if it went downhill, if he left shortly thereafter or what. But the bottom line is, if you are told that you're not going to be the starter, that doesn't usually mean that you automatically leave the program. Like you would probably then in most scenarios, play it out from that point on and sort of try and get better. And then probably enter the transfer portal when the transfer portal is in flux and teams are looking for transfers in the off season. I guess the one reason why I could see a player leaving now, as opposed to waiting out the rest of the season is the potential to maybe play in a bowl game. Because you transfer, yeah. you get the one-time rule, and okay, maybe you get to play in a bowl game because of the way that the, the whole thing shakes out. That's the only thing that I could really gather. Outside of that, I don't know. I, I don't get what the the purpose of, of leaving midseason. But hey, what, what would happen if, if Jason, Jason Simmons goes down with an injury? Guess who's starting next? It, it'd be Ben LeBros. So I don't know. Maybe there's something else out there that we don't know about. But this is a, a very odd situation. Luckily, though, your ACC linebacker of the week is also a safety, apparently. Right. Because, uh, <laughs> Good the, point. <laughs> I mean, um, I forget who the the ACC network pundit Eric is. Eric McLean, uh, right? Eric Eric McLean, Yep. Mm-hmm, yeah. Who makes his list of the top uh, safeties in the in the conference, and he put Michael Jones on there because he's too good to leave off of all the top fives. But uh, yeah. I guess you've got some positional flexibility there. If we get an ACC vote, which it's not looking likely, but maybe we will. We got to vote for uh, Jones as the AC, all ACC safety this year. It has to happen. We've yeah. all got to mm-hmm. just gather together and try and make that happen. Start a campaign. Yeah. Um, and we should mention Smurf Greenwood has now been labeled as the backup. He shifted from cornerback to free safety spot, essentially right behind Simmons. So it seems like he would be the guy. I guess they also got Neil Nunn there, who we really haven't seen much. And I know he's been coming back from injury and so on and so forth. So we'll see if he kind of now has a better shot of cracking the lineup, but we're going to get into uh, Dino's press conference thoughts in just a second. Then your Twitter reactions. Let's take a quick break though, to remind you about prize picks. If you are a college football fanatic, you need to go to prize picks. It is the daily fantasy made easy. And it's amazing time because you can hold me to this. A lot of my friends were telling me about this over the weekend before they even sponsored the pod. And then you brought it Mm -hmm. up. You're like, Oh, we got a new ad, a new sponsor on the podcast prize picks. I was like, oh man, like I've already had heard good things about that from my friends. So this is not just me promoting it because we have to promote it. I've actually heard it's good. I've been meaning to try it anyway, but they offer every sport you can think of. The cool thing is they have college football. Tons of college football props are out there. Any prop you can think of from yardage to touchdowns, even interceptions thrown. All of our new users, when you deposit, go use our promo code that is locked on and get a 100% instant deposit match up to $100. You pick two to five players typically, and over under on their projections, and you can win up to 10 times any entry, and it's just you versus the projected numbers. And I have heard from my friends that some of these lines are pretty easy to make some money. So head over to Prize Picks, use that promo code locked on. Don't hesitate right now. Check it out at prizepicks.com or go to the App Store and download the app today. Prize Picks is daily fantasy made easy. This episode also brought to you by Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it is impossible for local chain auto parts stores to stock all the parts that you need. Why endure often pointless or seemingly intimidating questioning and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand their warehouse happens to carry? When you've got computers and phones with access to rockauto.com, the choice is simple. Save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why spend 30 50 maybe even 100% more 
for the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership. Rock Auto is a family business serving do-it-yourselfers for 20 years, and their prices are always reliably low for every single customer. Go explore their easy-to-use website today and find the solution to your auto part needs. And when you go to rockauto.com right now, see all the parts available for your car or truck and write locked on in their how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you again right locked on in that how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you amazing selection reliably low prices all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com all right so getting into dino baber's monday press conference and of course it's like as often as he does a press conference on monday he throws in a movie quote or two as well we were joking about i don't know that. about you i'm sick of it I'm sick oh, yeah. of it. I, I want I've some been winning sick of it for two years. Yeah. How, how about we start <laughs> quoting like winning football coaches? How about that? Okay. Because I mean, last time I saw Steven Spielberg hasn't won a college football game. Okay. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I'm sick of it. It's not entertaining anymore. It's not cute. It was cool when you were doing the, the upsets, but when you're coming off a one in 10 and then you have an embarrassing loss, one of the more embarrassing ones of your career at Syracuse, right here i mean i'm done i'm done with it i i want to see actual tangible winning quotes all right yeah i want to see things that contribute to winning watching right. gladiator and, does not contribute to winning yeah th this was the quote it was something about gladiator and how the fans need to make the pick which honestly it seems like the fans are all really angered at devito and tired of devito so if you're really basing it off gladiator maybe they have made the pick if you want to dig into that quote too much it's really tiring, these whole movie quotes and everything. And, you know, we joke about it off the air a lot. And it's funny because uh, the guy Q's Football Hype on Twitter, shout out to him. He tweeted this at us and he was like, is the cake still baking? That's one of my favorite lines to throw at our friends off the air. And it's really the house just is becomes, on fire. All right. Because that cake yeah. is, is in the oven. It's burnt and, and the smoke detectors are going off. It's it's brutal because his press conferences are so predictable. Now he gets up there. Our, our young men are hurting back there. Cakes baking another movie quote. And I don't know. I mean, it is cute and fun when you're winning. And part of me does like that. Dino is kind of a fun bite at times, but at the same time, he's not giving out any information really on individual players. He's not talking about injuries because he's so worried about giving away an advantage. He did hint at Dakota Davis might be back against Albany. Garrett Williams is likely to play, which Maybe that's because it's Albany that he was more willing to hint this time. But the whole press conferences, I'm really tired of watching them. And I mentioned this on yesterday's podcast. But if you haven't, go back and watch the Rutgers postgame presser because that did feel like a different tone and a guy that really does feel like he's sort of losing interest and in really running out of gas as the head football coach. And I would say this one kind of had that same vibe to it. I mean, I, I felt yeah. the same way watching this one as I did the watching the one on Saturday. And it just, it feels disinterested almost. You, you had a chance. You had some momentum. You had some rallying behind you after that week one win against Ohio. Then the offense goes out and lays a dud. And one of the things that he opens up with is how the team lost two of the three phases. No, the team lost three of the four phases because one of the other ones is coaching. And he was simply out coached out there on Saturday. Right. And I've also come to the conclusion, you know, he hinted at, okay, we're still going to decide who the quarterback is. We're still going to play both of them, basically. The gladiator quote that he threw in there. I think he's just going to say that all year. I mean, even if DeVito yeah. goes nuts in the next three weeks, he's just going to say that because he's so trained to think that that gives the opposition some tough of – some, you know, they have to prepare for two quarterbacks then, and he's so convinced that that gamesmanship could add to it. And that's so much of what he is trying to accomplish at the podium. All he cares about is, all right, I know the opposing coach is listening to me right now. What can I say? And he's very conscientious of his thoughts and what he can and cannot say. Same thing when he's talking about not trying not to get fined. But I don't know. I mean, he, this isn't news. Like, he's going to say Schrader and DeVito are going to play every game for the rest of the season, probably, regardless of what happens, unless there's an injury, I guess. Right. And I think gamesmanship sort of works both ways because, OK, well, pull out your lie detector then and see what I'm saying is not like he said that both guys would play week one. OK, both guys played week one. But did they really both play week one? No. Week one right. was a, a one quarterback system. OK. And I thought it was fine. That's fine. Week two. OK. He said that. All right. Both guys are going to play. Both guys did play. And there was a scripted debut for Garrett Schrader. And, and now, listen, we're going to see the same thing the rest of the year, kind of like you said. Albany, I'm not gleaning a whole lot from this one, but I think 
when he brings up the quarterbacks and says the, the competition, he wants to see someone go out and win it. I'm with them. No one's won this competition yet. And I'm sorry to say it, but no one's going to win it against Albany either. Starting jobs are not going to be won in that game against Albany. Like you just now cannot I, compare it game or week to week. Sure. I guess the argument is how the heck can Garrett Trader win the job when you play him for a couple possessions when he's backed up to the five yard line and then you take him out once he finally got in a rhythm, right? And he didn't really play him against Ohio. So I mean, I think that's if you're a, a Garrett Trader advocate, your case is we got to see more from him. Right. And then we're going to get into a lot of these Twitter thoughts. That's a lot of what people have been tweeting at us, which I think is a huge conversation right now. And the whole case is, DeVito, we know what we've gotten with him. We know what we're getting week in and week out. Maybe it gives us a better chance to win three games versus two games if we play DeVito the rest of the year. But we're probably not going to win more than three or four games if we ride with DeVito. We know what we're getting. His ceiling is very low at this point. Schrader there could be something more to him. There could be more in there. And I think that's why fans still have some appeal towards Schrader and still want to see him in more of a defined role and more of an elongated role in a full game. And it's different than last year when it was Rex Culpepper versus Jacoby and Morgan. Rex Culpepper had never shown you anything at the quarterback position. Never. Like At least DeVito has at once upon a time shown you something. And the mystique of Jacoby and Morgan, the shiny new toy, um, at least that was there where there was an unknown. And it's kind of a different situation this year because Tommy DeVito is 10 times the quarterback Rex Culpepper ever was and ever will be. And I, I we can get to some more thoughts on it too. I, I think another interesting thing that Dino brought up was the part about the receivers and their decision-making and how they flat out sometimes just did not make decisions on some of these routes. And it was kind of Garrett Schrader sitting there or Dami DeVito sitting there being like, dude, are you going to go right? Are you going to go left? Are you going to come back? I, I have nowhere to go with this ball. Plus I've got four guys chasing after me right now because the offensive line is already folded. Yeah. The wide receivers aren't good. I don't think anyone is arguing that it's also, if you're Tommy DeVito and you're supposed to be a four-star quarterback, then you're supposed to elevate the guys around you to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And as much as the wide receivers have been bad, I think we can all agree if Eric Dungy was back there, we probably wouldn't be talking about the wide receivers as much as we have been. They've dropped some passes and they've dropped catchable passes, but also like DeVito has just not been good at staying poised in the pocket for now three plus years. So you can't really get too mad at the wide receivers. Well, it's, I think it's both because the wide receivers have to be smart enough to be making some of these breaks as well. And I think that comes down to coaching. Has Dino yeah. overcomplicated this offense to the point where, all right, these receivers that you brought in that you looked at their 40 times and said, all right, I want that guy on my roster. Do they have the, the mental capability to do some of the routes that and do some of these concepts that you want in the passing game? Or have you made this offense just way too complex for some of these guys, especially some of the younger guys, to come in and they just don't have a grasp on it? That, that to so, me, is a bigger problem, and maybe the offense just needs to be simplified. Right. So this is something I hit on a little bit yesterday, and I think I'm starting to really feel like that is a huge part of this. It's just this offense is too complex for a quarterback that's not Eric Dungy and not really instinctive and a really good playmaker. And Shout out to our guy, Dominic, because he tweeted at us a pretty similar thought here. I'll read it real quick. He said, I think DeVito wasted his time here. It makes me so sad. If he went to most other schools, he would have had a wildly successful career. People are looking for Schrader to be Dungy, but he looks like a deer in headlights. When you have two yeah. former four-star QBs that look bad, it's coaching. I think it's that last line there yeah. that I'm starting to really jump on board with. Like, If we do, I mean, we've had people tweet us and say, Garrett Trader was recruited by Alabama and Florida. There's got to be something there. We got to let him, you know, show his full skills here. And I get that. And I'm also kind of for it because I'm so sick of DeVito. So I'm fine with playing Trader more than they have been playing him. But also, maybe our offense just isn't designed for a quarterback that is not like, I don't know, really quick and really cerebral at processing information. Like maybe Mac Jones would be the perfect quarterback for our offense but no one else would. Or you have a guy like Dungy who is just incredible at making plays on his feet. And as I make this argument, maybe this is also an argument for why they should play Garrett Trader more because he's probably more Dungy than he is anything else. 
I just think this team, because of the coaching situation, has left itself in quarterback hell, where maybe there isn't anyone on the roster right now that has the capability to do this stuff. Like That could also be true, that the yeah. coaching situation has just created such a bad predicament for this offense that neither quarterback, no matter who you put back there, will succeed. That's also on the table. So let's put a pen in that for just a second. I want to tell you guys about betonline.ag. They are back in better than ever for the football season. As always, it is your number one spot for pro and college football action. New updated site and interface, even more odds, props, and contests. Betonline.ag continues to be the number one source for everything football. You can head to their website on a mobile device or a laptop, sign up today, and receive a 100% welcome bonus. That's double your initial deposit just for signing up for free. Just use the promo code NFL100. They've got boxing. They've got basketball. They've got Vegas casino games on there. So don't wait to take advantage of the amazing offers right now. You can also use our promo code locked on for some additional savings as well when you make your first deposit and you sign up for your free account today. Over at Bet Online, the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. So that's a good conversation that we were just having about Schrader and, and what Dominic said, because to me, what we're seeing now is that, you know, we talked about this before the year. We said, regardless of what happens in the quarterback competition, the quarterback play is going to be better because they'll elevate each other and it means someone will be better than the other one. And that means improved play, probably. I mean, it has to be better than last year. It probably has been better than last year. It has. But I'm starting right. to think, I'm starting to think that Dino's really botched this thing so much that I don't know how much that holds true because of the way that he has yanked the quarterbacks when they've gotten into a rhythm. He's not allowed Schrader to really show what he really has in a full game yet. And it's not like we're running out of time on the season to get Schrader in there. But at the same time, I mean, these are the games we're supposed to be winning. And it's pretty clear that DeVito's not giving it to us. So maybe we need to see Schrader in a more elongated role. I'm just worried that Dino has maybe changed so much fundamentally as a head coach that this is not what Syracuse fans were advertised. What happened to going fast? That, that yeah. doesn't happen. I, the play clock gets down to seven every single play, it feels like. You, uh, sometimes you have to call timeouts to preserve yourself from five yards. Um, the fourth down aggression is not nearly what it used to be. No. Um, all these different things have changed, and... Maybe this offense once upon a time was simpler where a guy like Zach Mahoney or Clayton Welch could come in and succeed. And now it's got, I don't know if Dino's changed the fundamentals of what he does offensively over the course of these couple of years, but has it changed that drastically to the point where you've got four star guys, a guy who went to the elite 11 camp should be some of these more cerebral quarterbacks that they, they, they can't pick up on it. I, yeah, I'm just wondering, has Dino just changed so much fundamentally as a coach after being at the power five level now for a handful of years that this is not the maybe he needs to go back to the old ways because the old ways, OK, it was four and eight, four and eight. But at least it was four and eight with a chance to beat and be in games at all times. And where if you got the talent that hopefully you can develop, those four and eights would turn into more eight and four, seven and fives as opposed to the the one in 10 that we saw last year. And who knows, is this a three and nine that we're headed down this year too? And I guess you could also say, how has he really changed as a coach or has he just lost Eric Dungy who sort of masked his issues and maybe even Sean Lewis, you could throw in there. A lot of people have been yeah. tweeting at us that losing Sean Lewis could be a root of the problem here as well, which I do tend to agree with a little bit, but I don't know. It's very frustrating because They've shown it to us at times, and that's why there was a glimmer of hope. Like, we did win 10 games under Dino Babers once, and the further and further we get away from that, his case gets weaker and weaker that it was him. His case is really very thin now, and it's come down to, all right, maybe that was just all Eric Dungy. And maybe if Eric Dungy stayed healthy, they would have won more than four games in the first couple of years. But if you don't have an Eric Dungy back there running the offense against – clear talent because I'll give them credit like Jimmy Garoppolo put up numbers in this offense but maybe it just doesn't translate to power five competition and even lower than power five like the only thing that they've done well this year is beat Ohio based on running the football and wearing them down and then they go out against Rutgers they hardly play Max Mang they hardly set up in tight end personnel like 12 personnel sets 
They're in four wide the entire game. I didn't really get that because it seems like our strength is running the football. I know they tried and it didn't really work, but I mean, if, if we can't abandon noticed, that either, that, that's yeah, we one noticed thing that, that these quote unquote offensive guru coaches do is you'll see them. They try to, to get cute, too cute with things at times and they abandon the simple principles of the running yes. game. And that's kind of what happened in this one. Right. And Tommy DeVito is nothing without a running game. So I would be trying every game to get our running game going because once it's going, that makes our offense completely different. We've talked so much on this podcast about how that offense is so much of it is predicated on getting the first down. So you can get into tempo. And that's why we haven't seen the tempo because they don't get first down. So they don't get going. And that one possession where they hit a big play to Taj, then you see the benefit of it when Sean Tucker runs up the middle and he breaks a tackle because the defense is probably a little bit tired, and that's how this offense is supposed to work. But when it's not working, let's just not abandon the run game altogether. No, and I think part of it, too, is the fact that with the passing game, Rutgers was so unafraid of Syracuse's ability to run the football. in that They, they just simply were not afraid of Syracuse's running attack because guess what? They could rush four guys Every single down. And, and go back and watch a lot of DeVito plays, a lot of the Garrett Schrader plays. Rutgers was getting pressure with four guys seemingly every yeah. single time. The offensive line was awful in this game, not just from a mental standpoint of the illegal formations and all that, but also from the, the physical standpoint of just being beat four on five pretty much every single down. And then you've got DeVito or Schrader running for their lives. And guess what? Not only are they running for their lives, but there's seven defensive backs slash linebackers out there in coverage. I mean, pretty much right. every single down, it was four, four rushers and then maybe a quarterback spy. Outside of that, they didn't need a bring. They, there was zero reason for Rutgers to bring a blitz that entire football game because they didn't have to. You're getting in the backfield yeah. with four. Yeah, Darius Tisdale was really bad. I think I saw in pro football focus, he accounted for five of the 13 pressures. Aaron Service wasn't good. Bergeron was good. I don't think he allowed any pressures on his tab on Pro Football Focus. But, but guess what? Outside of that. He had the illegal formation on the one really nice play yeah. that, that Schrader had that got taken back. On a third and five, when he hits Taj Harris on a screen, your, your helmet has to be on the line of scrimmage. I don't know what you're doing there. Like, d right. Does this team not have referees in practice with them to point out all of these little things? That's the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the penalties are egregious and getting Four illegal really, really tiring. Yeah, Four of them. I don't know how that happens. And honestly, that's like elementary stuff. Like, let's not overthink that. That's terrible even if you're in game one, even if you're in game two, regardless. You just can't be doing that if you're at this level of college football. Uh, let's end on this. Just a lot of Twitter thoughts were thrown at us. Shout out to some of the people that tweeted at us. Cuse Stan was the guy who brought up uh, – the trader was recruited by Bama in Florida, and it must not be nothing. I think that's a good point. Q's football hype, we've mentioned him, but he basically said you got to be fair on Schrader. He hasn't played in two years, which is why you play him at Ohio. Tommy has hit his ceiling. At least Garrett has potential. He needs to be given the Albany game and a real opportunity. Green Mountain Lax coach said, I won't pile on DeVito, but Schrader needs to start the next game. I've seen all I need to see from Tommy. Babers crapped his pants today. This was back on Saturday. Horrible display of coaching. And I feel bad for the guys on defense, honestly. Totally agree with most of those points. If you're Dino Babers now, how are you handling the quarterback situation against Albany? I think you do it. You, you treat Albany like a preseason game, like what we would see in the NFL with a preseason game. I think one guy gets one half, one guy gets the other half because I'm yeah. very confident that Syracuse is going to win this game. And if you can't win this game with either of these quarterbacks, then there's a larger issue at hand. OK, right. you should be able to win this game with one quarterback playing one half and one quarterback playing the other. It should be treated as a preseason game. I don't think you make a dashing decision off of this performance against Albany because it's an FCS opponent. But you want to see both quarterbacks, see what they look like when they get into a little bit of a rhythm and, and get a little comfort with them as well. I think in the case of Schrader, one thing that I will say, he was advertised as a running quarterback. I don't know if he's the better runner of the two between him and DeVito because there are a number of times where we've seen DeVito have to navigate through the pocket. I think of that Ohio game that happened frequently and some of the designed runs that DeVito has had. I think DeVito 
granted, it's a very limited sample size, and maybe we'll yeah. see more against Albany. But I do think DeVito has been a little more impressive. I think some of the stuff with Schrader trying to evade the pocket, get out of pressure, I have not been impressed. And he makes some really head-scratching plays. Like there's the one play where he, it ended up going down as a sack, but he gets out of the pocket a little bit, fumbles the football, scoops it up, and then tries to make a chess pass to avoid a, a sack. Yeah, he ends up odd. getting sacked right. anyways. But those plays, those instinct plays, I'm not a huge fan of. And I know Eric Dungy was kind of the king of that in the early portions of his career, but he got a lot smarter as a quarterback towards the end of it. See, I'm a, I'm the opposite there. I think for me, it's better than watching DeVito kind of sit in the pocket, fall on his back foot, and throw it like 20 yards out of bounds. Like, I, I like DeVito Schrader doesn't in that take game, any chances. Schrader in that game probably should have had two turnovers. In, yeah. And they came on the same – he should have had two turnovers in that game. And, and I it think, ends up going down as none. Two, right, he had two turnover-worthy plays as mm -hmm. sort of documented by Pro Football Focus. And we'll get into the PFF grades tomorrow. I'm all for starting Schrader, honestly. I, I don't think he was good. I mean, there's no denying that. But I saw a guy that was incredibly rusty, and it's probably impossible for him to be not be rusty. He seemed – kind of mentally not confident. He seemed timid. He looked really bad. But for me, the the best chance of us being good this year is Garrett Schrader. So play him against Albany. Try and build up his confidence. Try and get him some more knowledge of the offense if that's really holding him back. And see what you've got there. Because if we don't, then we're probably just going to win three games with Tommy, four games tops. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather win three games with Schrader and at least say, oh, at least we tried than win four games at DeVito. I don't really care if we win four or three. All I'm in this for is can we make a bowl game? And Schrader's the best chance of making a bowl game right now. I'll say this. I don't think it matters. I think the offensive line is that bad to the point where it does yeah. not matter who is that quarterback. Because if you have a secondary and it's seven on four every single time, Guess what? You're not going to win. You're not. I mean, look at some of these coverages downfield. No one is ever open unless a play really starts to break down, and then you see guys maybe find some soft spots in the defense off of improvisation. The offensive line is so bad to the point where I don't think it matters who's that quarterback. I, I yeah. really don't. No, you're probably right. I mean, they're probably going to win four when games even if they play Schrader three games. There's just there's so many issues with the team. Defense is not one of them, and and we'll talk some defense on tomorrow's pod, but. Yeah, I, Too I many think four man rushes are causing havoc. And when you have that as a part of your offensive line and the makeup and the identity of what you're doing offensively, you, you can't win the offense. Right. Hopefully Dakota Davis is some panacea. I don't think he will be. And it's nice that we'll It'll hopefully help. see him against Al Albany and it, it, it should hopefully make things better, but he can't play all five positions, and, and quite frankly, all five positions at the end of this season should be up for grabs heading into 2022. Yeah, and, and the good news is he replaces Darius Tisdale, who in my opinion is the weak link right now on the offensive line. So we'll see. We'll continue to get you guys ready for Albany, continue to give you our thoughts throughout the week. We're going to dive into the pro football focus numbers tomorrow. Some really interesting stuff on those pro football focus numbers, so be sure to tune in for that. We're here with you guys every single weekday. Subscribe to the show wherever you get podcasts and also subscribe to us on YouTube, dropping those in the lunch hour during the weekday so you can watch these podcasts on YouTube as well. And we will talk to you guys tomorrow.